Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and this is The Digital Age. Tonight's guest is Linda Fairstein. Linda Fairstein helped found, and for about 25 years, headed up the Sex Crimes Bureau at the New York County District Attorney's Office, Manhattan. She is also a best-selling novelist. Her Alex Cooper mystery stories have won her international acclaim. Her latest novel, entitled Silent Mercy, is off the charts as a bestseller. And she does other things as well. She is a close observer and has followed closely the DSK sex scandal case. And she has commented on it. And her comments have been on blogs from India to Taipei. And she is a friend of many decades, and we are delighted to have her with us. Great Linda. to be with you, Jim. Now, Linda, tell us a little bit about Silent Mercy. We can start with something very interesting. Uh, the title's a little curious. What is it all about? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, these novels, they're crime novels. Uh, the character is, uh, based on the write what you know theory, the character is a sex crimes prosecutor in Manhattan, who I frequently say is younger, thinner, and blonder than <laughs> I am. Uh, and so this book has a setting of religious institutions in New York. That's St. John the Divine on the cover with a, an actual statue from the garden there. So uh, mercy has to do with the, the religious setting, the people being killed all are killed uh, because of something they're doing in the, a, a one religious community or another. And silent, silent mercy comes from the, um, the old habit in uh, many churches of silencing people who are outspoken. Not doing it murderously as I do, but silencing them. Now, silent mercy is a murder mystery, isn't yes. it? Yes. And in fact, uh, all of your novels, you've written 13? Yes. Uh, all of your 13 novels have uh, been homicide uh, novels in some way or other, aren't they? Yes, they have been. And but Yes, and oh. so you're working on another one now? Yes, I am. And that's a homicide novel, too. <laughs> it's a murder mystery called Night Watch. And uh, Alex Cooper is the protagonist? She is, again, the protagonist, and she's uh, working on a very DSK-related matter in the background when she uh, gets the murder call. Ah, DSK. <laughs> now, by the way, is, uh, is Alex Cooper uh, the head of the sex crimes unit in the district attorney's yes, office? Yes, she is. It's rather <laughs> autobiographical. comes it's, close uh, to home. <laughs> it does cut very close to home, and I really drew from the wonderfully rich experiences I had in 26 years running that unit. Well, let's go back to uh, 1972 uh, when uh, the sex crimes unit uh, started. How many lawyers were involved in sex crimes prosecution? Well, there were none in 72, and uh, Frank Hogan was the DA in New York at the time, didn't believe that women should be in the workplace and really wasn't very progressive on these issues. Uh, and in 74, started up the unit with two lawyers. I was not one of them. And shortly after his death, when Bob Morgenthau took over, Bob asked me to take over the unit, and I expanded it immediately to four lawyers. And when I left uh, 26 years later, there were 40 doing this work. 40 doing sex crimes work. Yes. And how many are there today? About that, about just roughly 40, 44. And are they specially trained in, uh, in sex crimes? I mean, is this, is this an area of expertise? I mean, yes. could I, as a journeyman, uh, generalist <laughs> lawyer, learn anything about sex crimes? Well, you, I trust, could learn anything. <laughs> we start with good lawyers within the office. I know they, they start with very experienced trial attorneys who've done a variety of other serious felony cases. Then, yes, the training is, is specific. Um, how to deal both with the trauma that these witnesses have, have endured, um, what's different about getting them through the system. It's not like a, a robbery or a burglary where there may be far less emotional content. So you need to, to understand what the questions are specific to these cases. And also, people bring their own um, consensual experience to these crimes. So they think, well, I would never have done that. or the men I've been with wouldn't be able to do that. Um, these are cases of extreme dysfunction and um, aberrant behavior. So it's sort of teaching the assistants what's so different when these acts occur in a criminal setting. Well, sex crime is a crime of violence. It's not a crime of passion. That's uh, correct. Uh, uh, very violent. Very violent. Uh, and now, is part of the job of a sex crimes prosecutor to screen cases carefully? Well, it's, as you know, it's really part of any prosecutor's job. Uh, people come to you, I think you really want to assume that they're there for your help and that they're telling the truth. Um, but obviously, whether it's a robbery, I mean, my first bad experience was a victim, with a victim, and 
before I started doing sex crimes in 74, was, was a robbery victim who was 16. I believed his story. Uh, he was taking the rent to his mother's landlord when in fact it was money for a drug deal. So people lie to prosecutors and yes, uh, good prosecutors screen everything, but I think especially with, with sex crimes where victims have had such a bad experience being met by the system, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt coming in until something is a red flag. Now, uh, I mean, Professor Wigmore said it's the easiest uh, allegation to make and the hardest one to refute. And at one time, we had a requirement of corroboration in sex crimes cases. It had to be independently corroborated. Isn't that right? When I came to the practice of law in the 1970s, it was, it was true. And Wigmore got that um, wisdom from Sir Matthew Hale, Lord mm -hmm. Chief Justice of the King's Bench in, in 16... 64, I think it was, uh, and I think pretty foolish in this day and age to say it's an allegation easy to make because we've always subjected rape victims to a much higher standard. Uh, we've tended not to believe them. And corroboration, again, when I started practicing, was shocking to me that you could, in the same instance, have been robbed at knife point coming out of Grand Central. Uh, the jury could test your credibility, you could identify your, your attacker, uh, be cross-examined about it. In the same instance, if the attacker had said, come back onto this stairwell and raped that same victim, she was incompetent, as you say, as a matter of law, unless there was an eyewitness, unless there was some kind of medical evidence. This is long before we knew DNA uh, was a forensic science that would, that would prove identity. And um, there had to be the forcible nature of the attack had to be proved. So it was impossible to handle these cases when I when I joined the DA's office. And then also it was standard practice for the defense lawyer to go into uh, the sexual history of the complaining witness, isn't that right? The ugliest thing I've ever seen in my then young adult life. Uh, the victim's life was, was open. It was a fishing expedition, as we used to say. Uh, the defense could, if the burglar had climbed through the window, uh, the defense was still allowed to assume that the victim might have consented even to a stranger with a knife because she had previously had sex out of, out of wedlock. So um, until rape shield laws were passed in the late 1970s uh, in New York and other states throughout the country, uh, victims were exposed to horrible horribly invasive cross-examination. So we had two reforms. We, they abolished the corroboration requirement, right. and then we had a rape shield law where you couldn't go into uh, prior uh, sexual acts of the complaining witness, unless, of course, they were with the defendant. Right, exactly. And so these were huge changes in the 70s that, that w went from the point, 1970, there were a thousand men or more arrested in New York City for sexual assault. 18 were tried and convicted. Um, the rest were sent home. I mean, we didn't lose those cases. We just said, Madam, the law says you're not competent, and these victims would go home. Now, you so mentioned uh, DNA, and yeah. uh, it was the darling of the nursery in every <laughs> criminal case nowadays. Uh, the uh, DNA can uh, uh, cause the defendant uh, conclusively to uh, be convicted, and DNA can also exculpate the defendant, cause them to be acquitted, show that somebody else did it. So it was very useful. Huge. tool, but isn't it an irony that DNA is used for corroboration in, in rape cases, uh, so it's sort of corroboration has crept in through the black door, back well, door? You make a very good point because mm. it's crept in through the back door and, and now people come to expect it. And juries, a little bit because of fiction, an awful lot because of television and crime stories, uh, the juries knock on the door and say to the judge, we didn't hear, where's the DNA in this case? I mean, it, Well, in the cop crimes, rape case, there was no DNA, no DNA and the jurors probably. later said that was one of the things that persuaded them that they were not guilty. Absolutely. It's, so it's become a problem and we taught early on, trained prosecutors, to have to explain to jurors why in a particular case there was not or might not have been DNA. It's, it's, um, it's good uses are so much more profoundly important, both to exonerate and to convict. Uh, but when you don't have it, it's, it's quite a puzzle. Yes. Now let's turn to the DSK case, uh, which you're uh, working on in, in <laughs> fiction. Uh, and uh, it's really the stuff that fiction is made on. It, uh, it excites literary treatment, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it excites it. I mean, the twists and turns. Of course, I'm, I'm always looking for cases based, in fact, I'd never write uh, a story that's based on entirely on a real case. I like to use my imagination. When the first DSK stories came out, I immediately thought, as a, mm -hmm. as a novelist, mm -hmm. what kernel of this could I use? I would no more have imagined the twists and turns 
the case would take. And I also know that my editor from the first moment would have said, highly improbable, you know, <laughs> tone it down. <laughs> Couldn't possibly have believed it. Right. Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, the DSK case, they tell me, is uh, inspired an X-rated movie in France that they're yes. making. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, of course, no one apologizes for uh, DSK's morals. Uh, they uh, were absolutely uh, horrific. Uh, but the case, like most of these cases, was a one-on-one -on -one case in which the prosecutors had to rely almost exclusively on the credibility of the complaining witness, isn't that right? That's right, as most of these cases are. And uh, it sort of stands and falls on her testimony. And now, uh, are you uh, critical at all of uh, the way that uh, the, uh, the case was handled? I mean, there seemed to there were all these uh, charges in the press. They delayed for three hours before they questioned uh, DSK. They uh, rushed to indictment. Uh, as they were required to do because he was not admitted to bail and then uh, all sorts of facts came out later that uh, uh, tended to uh, diminish the credibility of the complaining witness. Uh, uh, is there another way that this might have been approached? I have looked at it critically over and over again and no secret that I am a friend of and and fan of our district as, attorney, as, am as I. are you, Cyrus Vance, <laughs> uh, and of the team of lawyers, I mean, a very senior, experienced team of lawyers who worked on this case, and picking it apart uh, step by step, I mean, the police had the first action to take, which was not a prosecutorial decision, but to take DSK off the plane based on that complaint. And I think they had no choice but to do that. They had a victim who wasn't a homeless woman. I mean, she was known three years to the co-workers. She was believed by the co-workers uh, who called the police. And I think that um, DSK was headed for a country with which we have no extradition treaty to get him back. Uh, everybody used the words Roman Polanski. I mean, you might not see him again. I think the police were absolutely right. I've seen him in Paris. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Having lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think the police had no choice but to do that. We then get to the perp walk um, for which the DA has been blamed. The DA, as you know, had nothing to do with that, and that was a police decision. Um, I'm not a fan of perp, perp walks for a variety of, of reasons. Uh, don't think it was a great idea in this case. Um, and then you get to the, should this have been slowed down before going to the grand jury? And I've looked at it very closely. I, I think it's easy to make the argument they could have slowed it down and wait, but I, I think it runs so counter to how we treat, how we want to treat credible rape victims today, and everyone thought this woman was credible. The people at the hotel to whom she was known, she was a good employee, a good worker of three years, nothing in her record to suggest otherwise. The first police who, who met her believed her. The detectives who had the case, um, great detectives. I worked with both of them. I trust them with my life. I mean, they're really fine detectives. Um, the hospital workers, both medical and social work, believed everything this woman said, and the first team of prosecutors. So um, I think had the only circumstance that's different, had he not been a foreign national able to leave this country and not come back, I'd say slow it down. But I, I don't think there was any reason until the information that the prosecutor began to get after the presentation uh, became an issue to, to think otherwise. Well, the Perp Walk brought about uh, international controversy. Uh, the United States was accused in the French press of having violent justice, right. a violent <laughs> judicial system. Here's what Mayor Bloomberg had to say about the Perp Walk. Well, I think it is humiliating, but you know, if you don't want to do the Perp Walk, don't do the crime. Um, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. Uh, our uh, uh, judicial system works where the public can uh, see the uh, alleged perpetrators. The real s sad thing is if somebody is accused, does the perp walk and turns out not to be, have, have been guilty, and then society really does, should look in the mirror and say, you know, we've got to be more careful the next time. Well, that's what the mayor said on uh, May 17th. Uh, on uh, July 5th, he changed his position somewhat. He said, and I quote, I've always thought that the perp walks were outrageous, 
They're not guilty until they're convicted. <laughs> and yet we vilify them for the benefit of theater, for the circus. You know they did it in Roman times, too. It's nothing new. <laughs> so which statement of the mayor do you agree with most closely? Well, I'm, I'm a little closer, <laughs> even the prosecutor and me, to statement two. I mean, statement one, interesting, people need, you know, have a right to know. I mean, there is a mugshot. There, there are even televised court appearances that give you that view of, of the offender, if that's what you want. And often the prosecutor doesn't want the public to have it. You're looking for other victims who you don't want to give that kind of identification opportunity. Uh, I just think the humiliation aspect of the perp work and the fact that it's staged entirely can't happen unless the cops and the press have gotten together on uh, where to be at a particular point in time. I assume there's another way out the back door of the station house. Well, and this guy was, uh, uh, DSK was televised in handcuffs uh, in the car. Here is the president of the International Monetary Fund. He was in line to be president of France, and with the French view was we're treating him like a common criminal. Well, I don't mind the Before he'd even been convicted. Well, I don't mind, and I know the French, as you know, have a very different standard of when you can identify someone, uh, not before a trial. Um, I don't mind that he's the head of the IMF and treated like any other common criminal based on real charges in the sense of mugshot, handcuffs. I just don't like the the public display that's staged that has nothing to do with the process. Perp work has nothing to do with the process of criminal justice. It's entirely an artificial event. Let's get back to uh, the so-called rush to judgment issue. Uh, he was uh, indicted three days after he was arrested. Uh, and then bail was uh, fixed. He could have been admitted to bail earlier, which would have taken the heat off the prosecutors in bringing an indictment. Uh, the, uh, how long normally does it uh, take to analyze forensic evidence in a sex crimes case of this kind? Uh, the forensic, we've got the state of the art, probably best lab, forensic lab in the country right here in New York as part of our medical examiner's office forensic biology unit. And uh, I trust that if the head of the people working on this case called the lab and said, we need these results tomorrow, they get those results tomorrow. Can't be in every case, but in a case like this, I mean, what you knew from the outset that again supported the victim and supported the prosecutors and police in acting as they did is uh, there's something called a Woods lamp that is a, that detectives carry with them. It fluoresces an ultraviolet light if there's seminal fluid. Uh, in, in the room. So the, po the police knew at the time that this complaint was made that where geographically in the room, just about where this woman said they would find body fluid, they found evidence of body fluid. Later analyzed, probably 24 hours later, preliminarily as, as DSK's DNA. But that put her right in the ballpark of credibility as well. Why do you say that? Uh, j because had she said you're going to find uh, I spit and here's where I spit and there's nothing on the floor, um, then maybe she's not telling the truth. But if sh she's saying you're going to find seminal fluid because I spit it out over here and the police find it already, that's something in her favor. That's the little things you look for when it's just, as you say, just her word. Um, you're looking to, to boost her to shore up her story and that's so it's like the game clue is colonel mustard with the uh, ice pick and the library <laughs> something <laughs> like that <laughs> like a linda fairstein <laughs> novel <laughs> something like that and it's again we don't need corroboration but here if people are saying well she's just the maid in the hotel she's now told a story uh and and there's a bit of evidence to back it up so that and then i believe by the time the prosecutors went to the grand jury they had dsk's dna in that room uh, where the maid says it's going to be. Now, he doesn't have to, as you know, say anything, but there's no logical explanation yet from him that, that says something counter to a crime being committed. Well, a logical explanation might be consensual sex, because the issue is not whether they had sex, the issue is whether there was force. Right, so now you take people trying to evaluate this situation, and you've got the man you've just described as possibly the next president <laughs> of France, the head of the IMF, we know probably at that point that there's been another woman in his room um, till two o'clock. We know this from key cards and probably surveillance in the hotel. Uh, so he's 
been sexually active recently. By the way, he's happily married mm -hmm. to a lovely woman who has footed the entire defense for this case. Um, and, and so the idea of consensual sex with the housekeeper um, seems very unlikely. He's on his way to the airport, actually he's on his way to meet his daughter for lunch, to go to the airport, to go back to France. And was this love that the housekeeper walked in the room and within nine to 22 minutes start to finish, he just pronounces that he's overwhelmed. That's what the French and call it a coup de foudre. A coup de foudre, exactly. <laughs> and thank you for <laughs> elevating this. Um, and so... Uh, it, but it, it could have been sex for money transaction. But it could have been that, no I mean question. The, uh, in the uh, recommendation of dismissal, uh, the district attorney placed great evidence, on, uh, emphasis on the fact that they thought it was a brief encounter. I don't know how brief brief is, but it certainly was within 20 minutes. Correct. And it may have been shorter. And they've never pinned down to this day how long the, the transaction took. Uh, but uh, if uh, it was a sex for money transaction, it might have been very brief and yet consensual. Yes, exactly. And never pinning it down is, I think, part of the problem um, when you look at, uh, at, by hindsight, the stories that the complaining witness told that were so different. I think the prosecutors have never been able to pin down exactly how long she says the encounter was. I mean, the problem for the prosecutors is those who carefully read the dismissal, like you did, um, are not that she claimed asylum and lied about it, that. I mean, every victim I've ever encountered lies about asylum. We want to get out of the same town. I'm going to make my story worse than your story has been. So that everybody expected, but it's the inconsistencies in this woman's tale inside the hotel room. Uh, they didn't appear the day before she went to the grand jury and all the examinations. They get her back, they're ex they've examined key card time entries, they're, they're trying to confirm everything really that she said and that's when they start to find inconsistencies. So in order to would say that uh, the direction of test was somewhat flawed because they're working to confirm her story rather than working to see what the holes in the story might be. The, uh, uh, I mean, a uh, seasoned sex crimes prosecutor, and correct me if I'm wrong, might have thought, uh, well, how long did this take? Let's, before we indict anyone, let's find out uh, what the key card evidence shows as to when she entered the room and how long she was in the room. There's apparently evidence at the hospital that she might have waited for him to get dressed and leave the room, according to her account in the hospital. They had all that. But uh, I think they did. I mean, they had a great sex crimes prosecutor, young guy, Artie McConnell, you know. on the team from the outset. Um, there are always going to be minute inconsistencies. What about her going back to the room, uh, which was contrary to what she said in the grand jury? She said she waited in the hallway until he left. But well, that, I think, was a huge red flag for the prosecutors after the grand jury. I mean, the only time. And again, it's Cy Vance and his team who who brought this forward to the judge. I mean, as you know, prosecutors around the country might have waited and let this play out badly in a courtroom. I'm mean, so I wasn't compelled to say... Oh, well, clearly dismissal was the right course yes. after everything yes. came out, but we're just uh, looking at what they knew pre-indictment that might have caused them to, uh, to wait not. a while. Well, pre-indictment, I don't believe they knew the issue of, of her going back into the room. I, I, I don't know the timeline entirely from the prosecutorial team, but reading the newspapers, it looks like they didn't find that out till afterwards. And that that's different than what she said about going and hiding in the hallway till she saw an employee. It raises huge red flags to me. I mean, why do you go back in to the crime scene emotionally? What if DSK, we know he left his phone behind. What if he turned around and came back for any reason? You've got your most feared assailant there if you're the victim. Secondly, um, it leaves open the fact that she might have compromised evidence. Did she go back to touch anything, to move anything, to, to deposit um, saliva or, or, or something. Or to get money. Or to get money because she thought the arrangement was he'll leave money on the dresser. Um, so that fact certainly played into the relook that the team gave to the case, I'm sure, uh, and with good reason. Well, I know as a prosecutor and as a novelist, you're interested in people's motivations. And uh, it seems like he took an extraordinary risk with his life. Here he's uh, on the line to be uh, president of France. He's head of the IMF. And, uh, you know, why would he have something to do with a maid in a hotel? And he's married and uh, has uh, children. I and mean, this is extraordinary. Yes, it is extraordinary. And I, I can only guess, because I spend a lot of time crafting characters uh, like that, that, um, that he'd lived with this kind of risk before, that it was not a new phenomenon f for him, 
um, perhaps uh, paid acts, perhaps he was used to uh, trying to engage women and, and pay them for sex. And her motivation may well have been money. Her motivation, it seems to me she was angry, peeved about something that happened in that room in that 20 minutes. We know there was some kind of sexual exchange. We know it from his DNA mixed with her saliva. So whether, um, whether he said something that offended her and there's no money involved without having to accuse her of uh, illegal conduct, whether he said something that upset her, whether he didn't pay, um, whether there was some other misunderstanding, I think uh, she was pushed she pushed herself to do this because of some great unhappiness uh, or score she thought she could make by making the claim. Uh, now, his three wives, who presumably were familiar with his astonishing sexual technique, yes. uh, have uh, came forward to support him. Indeed, as you said before, his uh, present wife uh, financed his defense. I mean, what do you make of all that? Maureen Dowd said they were all doormats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love Maureen Dowd. She'd say it better than I do. You know, often in cases, um, the, the current wife surprises me less. Uh, what we know about her, a woman of great stature, she's obviously stood by him through a lot of things. And as you said earlier, gives new meaning mm -hmm. to stand by your man. Uh, the ex-wives are a little bit more surprising to me. Linda, this has been perfectly marvelous, and unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. Is truth stranger than fiction truth. in the DSK oh. case? <laughs> so much stranger than fiction. Absolutely. Best question. Yes. Linda Fairstein, this has been just marvelous. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best. <laughs>